Hello everyone and welcome to Mr. Simplify's tutorials. In this tutorial we are simplifying Giselle's maturation theory by understanding what maturation is, what his principles of development are and by simplifying all of the associated concepts with relevant examples. Now American psychologist Arnold Giselle was considered a pioneer in child behavior and psychology. Before we learn about his maturation theory, it's important to understand what maturation is. Maturation is a lifelong process of growth and development that an individual experiences. It isn't a singular event, but a lifelong journey wherein we learn, change, grow and develop throughout our life. Let's investigate Giselle's maturation theory, the principles of development and associated concepts like the gradients of growth, reciprocal interweaving, functional asymmetry, and so on. Now, Giselle's maturation theory aligns with the concept of sequential development. This means that every child follows the same sequence of development, although their pace of following the sequence could be varied. He elaborated on two factors that influence development, genetics and environment. And since each child follows his or her own pace in development, genetics determines this pace of development. This also means that if children are taught how to do things before they are supposed to, they won't necessarily absorb information like they should. Although he considered the environment or, or environmental aspects to be important, he disagreed with theorists who emphasized environmental factors over genetic factors. Now we move on to concepts named the gradients of growth. Giselle observed the behavior of children in his clinic for over 30 years and came up with what he called the gradients of growth. Gradients of growth are 10 basic behaviors that all children go through and which are essential for their growth and development. Henninger quoted that Giselle's gradients of growth can be used by teachers to understand if their young students are demonstrating growth and typical behavior. These are motor characteristics like bodily activities, hands, eyes, and the growth of all of these parts, personal hygiene, emotional expression like crying, anger, etc., fears and dreams, self and sex, interpersonal relations like the mother-child relationship, peer relationships, etc., play and pastimes, so these are interests, school life, adjusting to school life, classroom behavior, etc., ethical sense like reacting to punishment, praise, or having a basic sense of good and bad, philosophical outlook, so this is a sense of language, sense of, of, of concepts like war and death, Teachers can observe a child's typical growth and development in these areas or gradients or dimensions of development and guide children if growth is lacking in any of these. Now let's look into the important principles of development that he proposed. As we know, Giselle proposed that development of bodily functions, motor functions, happens in an orderly sequence for every child. Giselle proposed five principles of development which characterize every child's growth pattern and should enable one to predict how most children will develop. Let's look at these now, starting with the first principle of developmental direction. Now, this principle states that development happens in a systematic direction because of our genetic programming. Motor development in this first principle has two characteristics or directions. This is very important. It is cephalocaudal and it is proximodistal. So cephalocaudal implies growth directed from head to toe, implying that an embryo's arms start appearing before its legs. So a growth in a human being happens from head to toe. Proximodistal means bodily growth from the center of the body to its ends. So bodily growth happens from head to toe and also in an outward direction, according to Giselle. The second principle 
is reciprocal interweaving. Very important. This concept refers to two opposite tendencies coming together to form a balance. So that's why we have reciprocal in this principle. For instance, a child could use one hand to lift an object and would then try the same exercise with the other hand. This then leads to the child having a preference of hand usage for future actions. The same co concept can be applied for personality development. A child could go through a pattern of introverted and extroverted tendencies and then integrate the two to form a balance. The next principle is functional asymmetry. Sometimes a behavior may go through a period of asymmetric or unbalanced development which later enables an organism to attain stability. In motor terms, this essentially implies an asymmetric posture which the body gets accustomed to to later figure out that it needs to be corrected. Infants can often demonstrate a tonic neck reflex wherein they turn their head in one direction when sleeping and they would have the same side arm extended while the other arm rests behind its own back. This is obviously an asymmetric position and this can often get corrected with the passage of time. The next principle is the principle of self-regulating fluctuation. He proposed that newborns are able to regulate their own patterns and determine their own schedules for eating and sleeping. As they develop, the number of sleeps needed per day and the number of meals needed per day reduces. This type of development happens in a spiral patterns alternating between equilibrium and disequilibrium while they're learning new things, hence called fluctuations. The next principle is the principle of self-individualizing maturation. This states that children must mature to a certain point before they can progress to learning new skills. For example, a four-month-old cannot use language to communicate properly because the infant's brain has not matured enough to allow the child to talk. Maturation patterns are genetically programmed, according to Giselle. But a child's environment and the learning that occurs as a result determines if a child will attain optimal development. Now let's understand how Giselle's theory is applied. Giselle's maturation theory is significant in the field of teaching and education. Students will enter the classroom and mature at different rates, as you would understand, and thereby progressing through developmental stages at different times. It is essential that teachers and course designers consider the maturity level of different students when designing lesson plans. Only by teachers doing this will students have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Teachers should also take students' maturity levels into consideration when conducting group activities. For instance, they should be pairing a couple of strong readers with weak readers, extroverted and introverted speakers together, and so on. Now let's look at some of the major criticisms to Giselle's maturation theory. Psychologists like Piaget have historically argued that the social environment a child gets exposed to is very important to development. The social factor is massively underplayed by Giselle. The theory is also famously criticized for the fact that it can mainly be used to explain biological clocks and biological development rather than intellectual and social development in children. Due to various factors in play at that time, Giselle was unable to observe children coming from diverse backgrounds. There are therefore no cultural influences also taken into consideration and also the theory doesn't take into consideration the maturation process of children with learning disabilities. Now these are some of the main criticisms that Giselle's maturation theory faces. Right, that is all we have for Giselle's maturation theory. I hope that was helpful for you. I thank you very much for your attendance as always. And I would highly encourage you to like the content in this channel, subscribe, share the word. And please, as always, please take very good care of your own self. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.